Okay, Matthew 17, verses 1 to 9, from the New International Version. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. <clears throat> there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Now to bring us the message. My brother Bob. Okay, I think we're okay. Hello everybody. Wow, it's good to be here. It's been, it's, it's been a long winter where I've been uh, fighting with uh, asthma and uh, uh, my medication not working, so staying home was a smart thing to do then. But I'm glad to be here with you and things are getting better. Um, may, the, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord. The theme of this week is on the mountaintop. The scripture identifies a lectionary, uh, the, the scriptures that the lectionary identifies for today are Psalm 2, verses 1 to 11, which looks ahead prophetically to the time when God would install Jesus as king on Mount Zion. In Exodus 24, Moses is set up to the top of the mountain to witness the glory of the Lord and receive the Ten Commandments. In 2 Peter 1, God confirms that he was present on the mountain with Christ during the Transfiguration event. But today we'll focus most of our time on the scripture Al just read in Matthew 17 and borrow a little from an article entitled The Father is Pleased by Eber Tikas from Speaking of Life, also based on the Transfiguration of Christ on the mountaintop. But before we go there, let me ask you, when was the last time you had a really strong sense of anticipation? When was the last time you were really excited? As a kid, I remember being so excited that I could hardly sleep on Christmas Eve in anticipation of Christmas Day. Excited about the, fa the family time together, some of our cousins and grandparents might come in from the States. We were excited about the great food, or beautiful Christmas carols that we sang at church and went home to bed after. Then waking up Christmas morning, a hockey stick and a puck. You believe it? That was all I needed. What did Albert get? Did Mom like what I got her? Did Dad? Would Dad like what I got her? Well, maybe great anticipation came for you at graduation, not at Christmas, or buying your first car, or maybe going on a much needed vacation. How about your wedding day? Maybe that was it, or for many, maybe it was purchasing your first home, or having your first child. Ask yourself, when the event you were anticipating had finally arrived, was it all you'd hoped it would be? Or did it exceed that, beyond your wildest dreams? Well, that must have been how it was for the three disciples of Jesus in the story we're going to be looking at today. The disciples had no way of knowing what was in store for them. 
As we look at the transfiguration story found in Matthew's Gospel, we can only imagine the anticipation, the excitement of the three disciples. We're going to start by looking at this anticipation of the disciples going up the mountain. Then we'll look at the transfiguration's remarkable significance. Finally, we'll end up with looking at how the transfiguration should affect us. We're going to read it again. Matthew 17, verses 1 to 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, <clears throat> This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. <clears throat> when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So Jesus takes with him three disciples, Peter, James, and John, to go up the mountain. This might have sounded similar to Moses, who had three of his closest, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, went with him when he went to Mount Zion to receive the Ten Commandments. Given the circumstances, do you wonder if perhaps this situation was similar enough that the disciples might have been anticipating something really big and really special was about to happen? We might wonder why Jesus chose these three individuals to accompany him in the key moments of his life, this being one of them. Peter's importance as leader of disciples is clear. He belongs there. John was traditionally considered the one whom Jesus loved, so that makes sense for him. And James, with his brother John, was among the first two disciples that, that Jesus called. You know, these three don't appear again together as Christ's inner circle until Gethsemane in Matthew 26. <coughs> there they'll accompany Jesus as he struggles through the night that culminates in his arrest. The Transfiguration and Gethsemane are two of the most intimate experiences that Jesus shares with Peter, James, and John, who witness both firsthand. Well, maybe in our minds this might not sound too significant, but to the Jewish mindset in those days, this was likely a big deal. This is anticipation. Jesus has taken us on the mountaintop. Wow, what's happening? They must have sought, thought something really important was about to take place. Why, I say? Well, on top of the mountain is where heaven meets earth, both spatially and spiritually. And a few other events in the history of Israel illustrate the potential powerful significance of Jesus taking Peter, James, and John up this mountain. Firstly, Abraham brought Isaac up to Mount Zion to sacrifice his son to God. God <coughs> gave Moses the Ten Commandments on a mountaintop. Isaiah prophesied about Mount Zion in a great feast. Jesus <coughs> preached his famous sermon on the mount. Elijah heard directly from God on the mountaintop. So for Peter, James, and John, this must have been like waiting for Christmas morning. <coughs> we probably can't begin to imagine how excitedly these disciples were filled with anticipation. The mountaintop is where encounters with God take place, where business is conducted in the spiritual realm. The disciples were about to have their minds blown. 
A few questions came to me about the Transfiguration itself. Why did the Transfiguration have to happen? And why did it involve Moses and Elijah? What was their purpose in being there? In his Gospel, Matthew was quite purposeful <coughs> to show how all the signs and wonders of Jesus overshadowed those of Moses. Matthew is intentional about showing the primacy of Jesus over and over again. In the vision, we see Moses again, but this time, he's accompanying Jesus. Here, Moses represents the law, and with it, all its regulations and commands, along with an extensive list of all the things you should and should not do. Elijah is also with Moses and Christ, on top of this mountain. Elijah is representing the prophets who inform us of what happens when you don't do what you're supposed to do. Verse 5, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, <coughs> This is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. You're going to hear me say that a number of times today. Listen to him. From here on, this event becomes even more epic. Peter's excited suggestion that they build tents for Moses and Elijah and Jesus wasn't really that unusual. But God the Father had a different idea for this particular moment. He interrupted Peter and told him, Listen to Jesus. Verse 6 says, When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. The disciples were so afraid that Jesus had to assure them that everything was going to be okay. And when they finally looked up, the only one left standing there with them was Jesus. Moses and Elijah disappear, and the only and only Jesus is left with the disciples. The voice of God the Father resounding from the cloud has an important message to convey to disciples and us. And here it is again. Listen to him. A listening heart is a heart warmed by the love of God and taught by his words. The one they're told to listen to is the Son of God, Jesus, transfigured in humanity. Listen to him, the Father tells us. Follow the one in whom I am well pleased. In other places, we learn the Father is pleased, pleased with those who follow the Son and in whom the Son lives. That's us, brothers and sisters. That's us. We didn't just die with Christ at baptism, but we rose with him. We're included in the Father's love for him. Jesus tells us the Father loves us just as he loved him. What belongs to the Son also belongs to us, and that includes the Father's good pleasure. I ask myself another question. Why did Moses and Elijah disappear so quickly in the Transfiguration? Well, God was wanting the disciples to focus on Christ and not on Moses and Elijah. God did not want the focus to be on Moses and Elijah, and God wanted the disciples to understand that. Jesus was the focus here. Jesus stood between the law and the prophets. He fulfilled everything in the law, and yet he also took all the punishment for us according to what was written by the prophets. Jesus gave the perfect response for humanity towards God, and yet, he also gave God's perfect response to humanity. Jesus now reigns supreme and is our rightful Lord. He alone is qualified to rule his kingdom with grace and truth. Our mistake can be that we've got the idea that somehow, we must somehow transfigure ourselves. We think we need to try harder to be worthy of God. But Jesus is all we need. We can never be worthy. Peter's suggestion that they build tents for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus 
showed he not yet grasped that Jesus alone was sufficient. The ways of Moses and the law, the ways of Elijah and the prophets, were also the ways of self-effort and fear. But we now know that it's only through trusting in the work of Christ that we can experience abundant life. Just one chapter before Matthew, uh, before this one, Matthew 26, Jesus makes this incredible statement. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Our righteousness comes from Christ only, period. We have to let go of the idea that we can somehow attain perfection from our own efforts. We must focus on the gift Christ represents to our life and the world, not on what we can or can't do. Much later in Peter's life, he wrote about this transfiguration event. In 2 Peter 1, verses 16 to 18, But we were the eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. The transfiguration shows Jesus in his full glory, completely fulfilling the law and the prophets. Seeing Jesus for all he is causes us to realize our utter lostness without him. He's perfect and he gives us perfection. He is righteous and he gives us his righteousness. We do not have and cannot attain perfection or righteousness apart from Christ. Do we get that, people? Do we get that? We are powerless to do anything of ourselves that will acquire us perfection. It's also interesting that in Peter's epistle, he fails to mention the fact that God the Father basically told him to be quiet and not to try to make plans for God. Sometimes for us too, the best thing we can do is to be quiet and trust in the Lord. Sometimes our best response to the glory of God when we see it is just to stay in the moment. Take it in, contemplate it, meditate. Be quiet. Brothers and sisters, I'm encouraging you to hear in this message something I am hearing loud and clear. Take a few extra moments when you're in prayer to listen, to contemplate, to meditate. Let him speak to you. It's important to reflect on how God has saved each one of us, how he has brought us through many trials and how he's come through, us, through for us in many of our times of need. And yes, how he has transfigured us as well. It's not what we have done or will do. Our great God will transfigure us perfectly if we are still and wait on him faithfully. The folly for each of us is in the forgetting. The forgetting that Christ alone is our sufficiency. Sometimes we want to take our old crucified selves and put the things we trusted in back on display when we think ourselves better than others, more intelligent, more faithful, more giving, more spiritual. We can be placing ourselves on very shaky ground when we try to use ourselves as the barometer for what's right and acceptable. Like Peter, we want to erect tents for Moses and Elijah. We try to do things of our own accord when only Jesus is necessary for life and godliness. Certainly, we have things to do. And we're about to restructure to do those things. We must serve and be ambassadors for Christ. But our salvation does not rest in what we do. It's Christ who does the work. Matthew 17, 6 and 7 says, When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. Jesus had to pick them up, <clears throat> dust them off, and let them know that all was well. 
Sometimes the voice of God can be scary to us. Where is he taking me? Can this voice be trusted? I don't know what I can do. I don't know that I can do what he's, he might ask me to do. But the voice of God is always the voice that is in our best interest. Despite whether we think it at the time or not, God will always prove himself faithful. And it's through this transfiguration, through seeing the true character and nature of God, that we become open to living out of his guidance and his strength. It's his posture toward us that causes us to lose our fear of the unknown and embrace the mystery that is the loving, that is the loving actions of God. Matthew 17 and 8 says, When they looked up, they saw, saw no one except Jesus. I'm going to read that again. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. The purpose of this passage of Scripture is for our focus to center on Jesus alone. The transfiguration shows us that Jesus is our only hope. Our hope and our salvation is not in the law and the prophets. It's in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Our best intentions or efforts will never do. Neither the systems of laws with all its expectations nor the proclamations and judgments of the apostles is enough. All has been fulfilled in Christ. He's accomplished everything on our behalf. 1 John 4, 17 says, As he is, so are we in this world. We've been included in the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit, enjoying all the benefits that come from that relationship. We've been transfigured with Christ, and one day we will receive the promise of a full and final transfiguration too. Like Moses and Elijah, the former ways of this world will disappear, and we'll find ourselves bowing before him, the only thing left standing, Christ. I want to suggest we ask ourselves a couple of questions as we think about this message of the Transfiguration. Just some food for thought over the next while. Some things to reflect on. First questions are, what do you think this event did for the disciples that were present? Do you think they were in anticipation about what would happen next in Christ's ministry? What about us? Have we lost our first love? You know that, that love, that anticipation and excitement that we once had, that God was about to do something amazing in our lives? The transfiguration is about Jesus and us. When we are with him, we are with the divine. When he is with us, he is with the human. His love, his grace, his sacraments, his peace, and his compassion can and will transfigure us. And when we look at those around us, we can see them as God sees them, as people also capable of transfiguration. We need to be present in prayer in the light and brightness, to allow light to invade our bodies and to know the light of Jesus given and baptized in, in our baptism is never extinguished. The voice of God the Father resounding from the cloud has this important message to convey to his disciples. And that message, again, is listen to him. In my preparation for the sermon, I came across an important and intriguing idea. I've heard this before, but it really touched home this time. The idea is that prayer is better described by some as listening rather than speaking. Prayer is meant to be a conversation. Our tendency in prayer might be described as talking at God if listening is not involved in our prayer life. Combining prayer with scripture reading is an excellent way to listen to God. We need to spend some time repeating, echoing His words in the study of His Word. Or when we're praying, just allow the mood of love and peace during our prayer to soak in deeply. Listen to him. This is directed at Peter and the others. This is also directed at you and me today. To listen to Jesus 
is to hear what he has to say, to accept what he says, and to make it our own, to identify with it fully. At the sound of God's voice, those disciples prostrated themselves on the ground, terrified. They hear the gentle voice of Jesus, get up, rise up, and don't be afraid. Jesus' words point to a resurrection, to a new life, and the abolition of fear and anxiety. Imagine this scene during our time of worship, during prayer, or even now. Can you hear the gentle voice of Jesus speaking to you? Listen for that. It might sound strange as a practice, I'm saying, I know. But I think we should all try very hard to listen. The disciples on the mountaintop see Jesus revealed in all his divine glory. It's a special moment for them as Peter confirms it is good for us to be here. It's good for them to be there, to listen to him, as God says. And I, as I said before, listening is a heart warm by the love of God and taught by his words. The one we listen to is the Son of God, Jesus transfigured in his humanity. But do we spend time listening? I mean, really listening when we're in prayer? You see, when Jesus went up on the mountain, he took with him a few of his closest friends and they saw Jesus was suddenly shining like the sun, all full of light. It made them pretty terrified. Then they saw Moses and Elijah, some well-known historical figures. They didn't know what to do now. And then they hear the voice of God announce, this is my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. The disciples realized they were in God's presence and fell flat on their faces in fear, but Jesus comforted and encouraged them to get back up. The disciples had caught a peek of who Christ was. When Jesus came to earth, it was sort of like he was God in disguise. He was truly and completely a human person, but he was also totally God. Many people at the time had been waiting for a Messiah and wondering what he would be like. The disciples had even wondered if Jesus was really the one they had long awaited. They thought he was, but this experience on the mountain took away any possible doubt. Seeing Jesus transformed in that way and hearing God's voice made them absolutely certain of who they were following. This was really Christ, truly God's Son. Now, how do you think that made them feel? Well, they were probably very relieved at knowing who Jesus was for sure. And they were also probably very excited. And I'll bet they hurried down that mountain to tell the other disciples and couldn't wait to spend more time with Jesus. Are we that excited, brother? We should be. After all, we've had more than just a peek. We know the rest of the story. Jesus not only lived as a human, but he died and rose again so that we could have a full life with God. He was really God and he became a human being, a person, just like us. Knowing that should make us shine with the hope of Jesus. We should be overly eager to share that with others and celebrate the love that God has for us. In the Father's great love for us, take root in our hearts today. And may we see ourselves as the beloved children in whom the Father takes great pleasure. The transfiguration was a wonderful and blessed gift for us today. And we didn't have to go up a mountain to witness it. We know that Jesus was the final fulfillment of all that had been hoped for. And he is still our joy and all we need today. Let us, brethren, be truly thankful to God for being able to understand what he has done for us.